In Switzerland, Trotsky began working with the Swiss Socialist Party and wrote a book, The War of the International, in which he opposed the war. Yeah, although Trotsky might have been against the war in words, he did not actually take a firm anti-war stance. That's why he did not support Lenin's idea of turning imperialist war into revolution. He did not join the Bolsheviks, he did not support Bolshevism. He did participate in the Zimmerwald International, which was an anti-war international created by mainly Lenin. But in the Zimmerwald International, Trotsky supported the right wing, which was against Bolshevism, and which was making uh, basically concessions to the warmongers and did not take a firm anti-war stance. Lenin had returned to the capital from Western Europe in mid-April and had quickly established the Bolsheviks as one of the foremost groups in the divided politics of Russia in the weeks after the February Revolution. Despite his non-alignment with either the Bolsheviks or Mensheviks in the years gone by, Trotsky now drifted towards Lenin's position, which increasingly sought to overthrow the provisional aristocratic regime and establish a socialist government. Yeah, so Trotsky had his own group at this point, which was called the Mizrayansi, and his entire party asked permission from the Bolsheviks if they could merge into the Bolsheviks. During this time, Lenin was underground, he was in hiding for his own uh, protection, because the uh, government wanted to arrest and kill him. So, the Congress, which accepted Trotsky's party into the Bolsheviks, was actually led by Stalin on Lenin's behalf. Trotsky had always been extremely against Bolshevism. You know, there's this rather infamous letter he sent to uh, a Menshevik in 1913, where he says that uh, Leninism is lies and poison. I'll put it on the screen so you can look at it. In 1917, when Trotsky and his group were debating if they should join the Bolsheviks or not, Trotsky, he rationalized it by saying that Bolshevism is crap, he doesn't support Bolshevism, he said, quote, we should not be made to recognize Bolshevism. But then he said that, actually, Bolshevism has stopped being Bolshevik, and Bolshevism has de-Bolshevied itself. So it's not actually that we are joining the Bolsheviks, actually the Bolsheviks are kind of joining us, as ludicrous as that is. According to Alexander Kolontai, Trotsky said that he is agreeing to join the revolution led by the Bolsheviks with certain conditions, within certain limits. So he doesn't have full agreement with Lenin. Later on, of course, Trotsky would completely try to rewrite everything and he would say, oh, actually, I'm the best Bolshevik, I've always been so loyal to Lenin and, like, I'm such a Leninist. And, you know, it went to such absurd lengths that Trotsky even started calling his group Bolshevik Leninists, which is, imagine being the guy who says that Leninism is poison and saying that he doesn't recognize Bolshevism to then calling yourself a Bolshevik Leninist. It is pretty funny. Trotsky is then said that, okay, we were wrong in the past, but now we agree with Lenin. Uh, Trotsky still had constant disagreements with Lenin about everything. Clearly, he was not actually a Leninist. And these disagreements were not about something small. They were all issues of principle and issues of theory and ideology. And especially after Lenin dies, then Trotsky, you know, he doesn't have to pretend to Lenin that he is a Leninist. So then he starts to, you know, bring back his old theories, such as permanent revolution, which Lenin had always criticized. But once Lenin was dead, Trotsky starts to bring it back. And he starts to go back fully into blatant Trotskyism. Trotsky's role in inciting the revolution which followed Lenin's return to the capital cannot be overstated. The Revolutionary Military Committee had appointed Trotsky as its chairman, and he was instrumental in the seizure of power in Petrograd through the October Revolution. That is actually a mistake, if not a deliberate lie. The documentary is confusing the Revolutionary Military Committee with the Revolutionary Military Council, also known as the Revolutionary War Council, which was established only after the revolution in 1918 to handle the civil war. The Revolutionary Military Committee, which carried out the revolution, was not led by Trotsky and did not even include Trotsky. Historian E. H. Carr writes in his book The Bolshevik Revolution, Volume 1, Quote, at the conclusion of the October 16, 1917 meeting, the Central Committee met alone and appointed a military revolutionary center, military revolutionary center, consisting of Sverdlov, Stalin, Bubnov, Yuritsky, and Cherchinsky. Unquote. By the way, Trotsky hated pretty much all of these guys. People would probably call them Stalinists. Trotsky's star was in the ascendant. Nobody other than Lenin was more powerful within the new regime. That's debatable. I know Kotkin said that Sverdlov was the second most powerful person in the um, Soviet government. And when Sverdlov died, Stalin became that. Why would the foreign minister be the second most powerful person? 
Trotsky actually, like, he had a rather nihilist approach to even his position as foreign minister. He said that, like, uh, since we're building socialism now, like, things such as ministries are pointless, and the first thing I'm going to do as foreign minister is to dissolve the entire ministry. He was going through this kind of uh, ultra-left nihilist phase where he said that law is going to wither away in a very short time, that foreign ministries are going to wither away, that diplomacy is going to wither away, that everything is just going to very quickly dissolve and wither away and disappear because we're going to rapidly move to communism. Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, signed on the 3rd of March 1918, and named for the Belarusian town where it was agreed, Lenin was clear that this was an utter humiliation. But the treaty provided the Soviet state with time to secure itself at home against its domestic enemies. Lenin said that uh, the negotiations for the Brest-Litovsk peace treaty were one of the most serious situations in the entire history of the Bolshevik uh, Revolution, and on this very important occasion, Trotsky fiercely opposed Lenin. Trotsky's methods as commissar for military and naval affairs could be brutal. In order to instill greater discipline in the rank and file, he devised the notorious blocking units. Special units which were placed behind the front line of the Red Army's troops, charged specifically with gunning down any of their own soldiers suspected of trying to desert or retreat. Many years later, in his autobiography, he laid out his thoughts on this. An army cannot be built without reprisals. Masses of men cannot be led to death unless the army command has the death penalty in its arsenal. So long as those malicious, tailless apes that are so proud of their technical achievements, the animals that we call men, will build armies and wage wars. The command will always be obliged to place the soldiers between the possible death in the front and the inevitable one in the rear. So while there's nothing wrong with blocking divisions in principle, like obviously any army has to stop desertion, desertion is oftentimes uh, punishable by death, but it is interesting that usually capitalist uh, propagandists, they blame Stalin for this. They say, oh, in the Second World War, Stalin uh, had these horrible blocking divisions, etc., etc., while in the Second World War, they were not nearly as brutal as this. In fact, it is often characterized that in the Second World War, if anybody even tried to retreat, Stalin would just have them all shot from the rear, which is entirely false, entirely baseless. All that being said, Trotsky did have a reputation for being brutal, very commandist, tyrannical, which eventually made a lot of people dislike him. Trotsky was also a firm proponent of the Red Terror, the ruthless suppression of political dissent and the use of labor camps. Again, there's nothing in principle wrong with terror. Like, all you have to do is read Engels on authority. Engels says that the proletariat has to scare the bourgeoisie into submission by the terror of its weapons. They have to say, look, you have to surrender your power to the working class. The workers are going to take over. You have to stop violently resisting the workers. So the Red Terror is defensive. A government which was headed by Lenin, but which was not a dictatorship like that which emerged in the 1930s under Stalin. It's interesting they say that the Soviet Union under Lenin was not a dictatorship, but under Stalin it was. I wonder what that's based on, like, what specifically supposedly made Stalin so undemocratic, like what actual changes in the party or state structure or anything like that supposedly changed to make Stalin less democratic than Lenin. And in 1921, Lenin's government began introducing the new economic policy, a market-orientated economic policy which allowed individuals to own small amounts of private property. It was fiercely opposed by Trotsky, who had placed himself by the early 1920s as the far left of the Soviet hierarchy. By the way, I have a video on the new economic policy, so if you want to see what that was all about, then you can check out my video. I'll put a link to it in the description. It's actually very ironic that, even though Trotsky opposed the new economic policy initially, later in the Stalin era, when Stalin wanted to abolish the new economic policy and build socialism, Trotsky began saying that, uh, no, that's actually impossible to do. As Lenin's health had deteriorated from 1921 onwards, it had become apparent that there were two major figures who might succeed him as the ostensible head of the Soviet state, Trotsky or Stalin. I think that was far from clear, to be honest. As far as I can tell, at least based on historians like E.H. Carr, Trotsky was really not seen as a very realistic successor to Lenin. Stalin was made head of the party by Lenin already in his lifetime. Zinoviev tried to make himself seem like Lenin's appropriate successor. He stressed that he had always been close to Lenin, been working with Lenin for a very long time, etc., etc., it pretty quickly crumbled because people thought 
that it's just a facade, that Zinoviev, he's trying to make himself look more important than he actually is. He's trying to pretend like he was always some kind of loyal Leninist, which is not really the case, because even though he worked with Lenin for a very long time, there were crucial times when Lenin needed him and he betrayed him. Zinoviev and Kamenev were the only two Central Committee members who opposed beginning the October Revolution. And they even leaked the plans of the revolution to the class enemy, which is why Lenin initially demanded that they should both be expelled from the party. During that same period, Trotsky was kind of working with them, because Zinoviev and Kamenev said that maybe they could come to power peacefully through a parliamentary road, so they should wait until the Second Congress of Soviets at least. Trotsky supported them, but not openly. He didn't say anything about a peaceful parliamentary road. However, he did say that the October Revolution should not be started until after the Second Congress of Soviets. However, Lenin and the other Bolsheviks were adamant that it should begin as soon as possible. If it began after the Second Congress of Soviets, it would already be too late, and the entire October Revolution would fail. I'll talk more about that in my Kolontai series when I get to that point. I'll put a link to that series in the description if you want to check that out. After the October Revolution, Zinoviev and Kamenev were frequently in opposition against Lenin. They demanded that the Bolsheviks should not take power alone, but that they should invite the right SR party and also the Menshevik party into the government together with the Bolsheviks. Lenin and the rest of the Bolsheviks did not agree, so then as protest, Zinoviev and Kamenev resigned their posts, which Lenin again said was uh, basically desertion and dereliction of duty. And, you know, they continued participating in the left opposition against Lenin consistently. So people pretty quickly saw through Zinoviev's BS, they saw that he was not really very credible. So then, who could be Lenin's successor? Gradually, Stalin emerges as the obvious choice. Within the Politburo, things had begun to shift. Trotsky was not the most naturally gifted or ruthless of politicians. That's a rather stupid thing to say. Trotsky was definitely just as ruthless, if not more ruthless, than most other Bolsheviks. And I really dislike this idealist explanation that whoever won in the power struggle was always just the person who was most quote-unquote naturally gifted, the best schemer or something. No. Different political leaders represent different political trends. Different political trends represent different classes. Stalin represented the revolutionary proletariat, which was building socialism in alliance with the peasantry. Trotsky and his supporters represented capitulation before world capitalism. Lenin had his suspicions about Stalin. He changed his last will and testament to warn the party about Stalin and anoint Trotsky as his successor as head of the Soviet state. Okay, so this whole thing about Lenin's testament, I've talked about it so much in the past that I really don't even want to get into it, but I'll put a link in the description to a really good video about the topic. Basically, the so-called testament of Lenin, it refers to a bunch of letters that Lenin allegedly wrote. The problem is that Lenin didn't actually write them. Uh, actually, the story is that since Lenin was paralyzed and he couldn't write, he supposedly dictated the letters and his secretary wrote them down. However, there is no proof that they were ever dictated by Lenin. Instead, there is proof that they were created by Zinoviev for a number of reasons. First of all, the content of the letters doesn't really make any sense. The writing dates and the release dates of the documents don't make any sense. According to the records of Lenin's secretaries, he was not dictating anything on the days when he allegedly dictated those letters. And to me, the most important thing is that even when Lenin was half paralyzed and he could barely use one of his arms, whenever there was some kind of document, he would still sign it. He wouldn't be able to sign it with legible letters, but he would at least, you know, scribble something on it just to prove that it was really from him. That's how signatures work. But these things, they're not signed. He wrote other texts around the same time, which we know are by him and they are signed, but these ones are not. There are so many different things which make it rather clear that they must be forgeries. And also these letters, the so-called Testament of Lenin, they don't say that Trotsky should be Lenin's successor. What they do instead is they criticize every single party leader. They criticize Stalin, they criticize Trotsky, they criticize Buharin, they criticize Zinoviev and Kamenev. And while they do make Trotsky seem perhaps a little better, they still make heavy criticisms of Trotsky. And it seems like the point of these letters was only to remove Stalin, and then that would leave Zinoviev as the most obvious candidate to succeed Lenin. They wouldn't actually have put Trotsky in power. 
Another thing that's interesting about the so-called Lenin's Testament is that all the criticisms of the various people, they're not original critiques. They're not critiques that Lenin would have come up with from his brain. Instead, they are criticisms that were all publicly well known, such as that Buharin didn't understand dialectics, that comes from uh, Lenin's speech on the trade union debate, the betrayal by Zinoviev and Kamenev, the fact that Trotsky used to always oppose the Bolsheviks. They were public record, meaning that this text could have been written by anybody. The forger would have had access to all this information easily. The criticism of Stalin is that Stalin was too rude, and that is the only exception. That criticism was only known to a small group of people. It was known to Lenin's wife, to Zinoviev, and to Kamenev. And it comes from the fact that Stalin had a fight with Lenin's wife Krupskaya because uh, Krupskaya was not following Lenin's health regulations properly. They had a fight, Krupskaya told Zinoviev, Zinoviev told Kamenev, then they created this forgery. 1927. In October, Trotsky and Zinoviev were expelled from the Central Committee, when they then attempted to organize counter-events to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the Bolshevik seizure of power in October 1917. The pair were expelled from the Communist Party. Yeah, that's actually entirely correct. Trotsky and Zinoviev were expelled for factionalism because they organized protests against the party. Organizing against the party is not compatible with party membership. Eventually, Kamenev and Zinoviev capitulated to Stalin at the 15th Party Congress in December 1927. However, Trotsky refused. As a consequence, in January 1928, he was removed to Kazakhstan, east of the Caspian Sea before being deported to Turkey. That's also entirely true. Sergei Kirov, a senior Bolshevik politician, was assassinated on the 1st of December 1934. His murder was used as a pretext for the removal of Stalin's former allies. Yeah, capitalist propaganda always says that the assassination of Kirov was only used as a pretext by Stalin, but the fact is that Zinoviev and Kamenev and others were guilty of the assassination, and that is why they were punished for it. I actually have four very long and detailed videos about this topic. I'll put those in the description as well if you want to look at them. His last years in exile were not spent idly. He remained a prolific writer, writing several books including his History of the Russian Revolution and his autobiography. Yeah, this is when Trotsky achieved his final form, basically, when he wrote Revolution Betrayed and uh, The History of the Russian Revolution and his autobiography, My Life. That's when he started heavily rewriting history, and that's when he became the kind of Trotsky that most people know these days. He had been talking about the quote-unquote Stalinist bureaucracy already previously, but while Trotsky was in the Soviet Union, he was more often criticized for bureaucracy himself, rather than him criticizing other people for bureaucracy. But once he was out of the country, once he was in Mexico, he was mostly trying to appeal to American liberals, so he started rewriting history. His American readers, they had absolutely no way of verifying any of Trotsky's statements. He could make up whatever BS he wanted, so he just, you know, started lying to them. Just to give you some examples, according to Farnsworth, Kolontai, quote, shared the suspicion of another communist that Trotsky did not want to destroy the bureaucracy so much as he wanted to control it, unquote. And according to another source, quote, Kolontai's comments on the defenders and knights of bureaucracy were aimed at Trotsky. Stalin was later to describe Trotsky, not without reason, as the patriarch of the bureaucrats, unquote. And Lenin described Trotsky's actions in the following way. He said, quote, there you have an example of the real bureaucratic approach, Trotsky. The sum and substance of his policy is bureaucratic, unquote. In 1938, he and his supporters founded the Fourth International, a communist revolutionary and internationalist alternative to the Stalinist Comintern. I don't think the Fourth International has actually ever really existed. Especially back in those days, there were really not that many parties who would have supported Trotskyism. The Fourth International really was not an international in the sense of the Second International, let alone the Comintern. And these days, well, there have been like a million splinter groups which all call themselves the Fourth International, but none of them really are any significant kind of international. On the 24th of May 1940, Trotsky survived a raid on his home by Stalinist assassins. Yeah, before Trotsky was killed, there was at least one attack on his house. I think there were actually two. I'll put some sources about that in the description as well. 
because it seems that at least one of those was organized by Trotsky himself, and the other one, I think, was a protest by a bunch of communists who were angry at Trotsky, and they knew that Trotsky was working with imperialist secret services, including the American secret services. By the way, documents have been released, I think, since the 90s, which have demonstrated that. I'll put a link to those as well in the description. They protested against Trotsky, but some of them then decided that they want to break into his house and they want to find documentary proof demonstrating that he's working uh, with Imperial Secret Services. So that's what that uh, assault on his house was about. A Stalinist agent broke into Trotsky's home in Mexico City and drove an ice axe into Trotsky's skull. Yeah, I wonder, if he had actually been a GPU agent, then why not just use a gun or a knife or some kind of more uh, conventional or more effective weapon? It seems like if he was just a random ex-Trotskyist who got angry and wanted to kill Trotsky, then he might have just uh, grabbed whatever he could uh, get his hands on, but if he was really a professional assassin, you would think that he would have a gun. The theory of permanent revolution, which influenced communist thinkers in Africa, the Caribbean, and Latin America, America for decades to come. It's a shame that it doesn't give any examples, like influenced communist thinkers in Latin America and Africa. Like who? Like Hugo Chavez? Is that it? Like, that's the only thing I can think of, and yeah, I really don't see any of Trotsky's influence in Chavismo. 